There is a very strange story attached to that memorial tablet, Miss Bradshaw, said the rector, pointing to a simple stone slab on the north wall of his little church. St. Mary's, Northbridge, is a square, red-brick Georgian building, balanced atmospherically on the edge of the mudflats of the River Crouch estuary in eastern Essex. And I was there to clean a rather grand wall monument to some early nineteenth-century member of the local Barkstone family, a bequest having been made for the purpose by a recent descendant. The much humbler memorial to which the Reverend Jim Shaw and myself were addressing our attention at the moment, however, was immediately to the right of the other. The inscription was terse, to say the least. Hannah Waite, 1809-1851, to Ne Resurgat. Have you ever seen such a motto before? the rector asked, in a tone which made it clear that he was certain I had not. No, I, I can't say I have, I replied. Resurga means I will rise again. It's found quite often on funeral hatchments, but ne resurgat looks like a subjunctive, so I suppose it must mean let her not rise again. I can only think that someone wanted to make sure Hannah Waite stayed where she was. You've hit the nail on the head, he nodded. I went into the history of the Waits ten years ago when I took up the incumbency here, and I always meant to write it up for a local magazine, but never had the time. It caused quite a stir when it happened. Apparently, Ernest and Hannah Waite lived in a cottage which used to stand a few hundred yards from here. Ernest was a violent man and a drunkard, but his wife seemed to cope with him until he somehow got the idea that she was a witch who was torturing him with terrible pains in the head. I smiled and was about to make some comment, but the Reverend Shaw forestalled me. Yes, you're right, of course. The liquor was almost certainly the culprit, and his long-suffering wife completely innocent. At any rate, one day Mrs. Waite disappeared. Many of the neighbours believed that her husband had done away with her, but there was no proof. A week or two later, Ernest also vanished, and when some of the villagers broke into the cottage to look for the couple, no trace of them could be found. Not, that is, until one of the searchers opened the larder door to reveal a grisly discovery. The decomposing head of Hannah Waite. That object was eventually interred here in the church, and the husband was never seen again so I imagine he must have panicked and run away, maybe to Harwich and a ship abroad. There was a superstition that the only way to prevent a witch or vampire from returning after death was decapitation, I said, after the rector had finished. Perhaps that's why Ernest Waite removed his wife's head. I must say it's certainly a very nasty story. I'm not sure I should thank you for telling it to me. Well, he chuckled, it could have been worse, Miss uh, Jane. I could have waited a few minutes and told you over lunch. Grateful for small mercies, I followed him to the rectory for the promised meal, stopping briefly on the way while he pointed out the site of the Waits' cottage. In the afternoon I had cause to remember Jim Shaw's narrative. I use a small stepladder for work which is just too high to reach from the ground, and I needed it for the Barkstone Monument. Stepping down after finishing the day's labours, I missed my footing on the bottom rung and made a grab for the wall to steady myself. The plaster gave way under my hand, and I was precipitated to the ground with a bump in a shower of plaster dust. For a few seconds my only thought was to make sure that no bones were broken and no damage done, to me at least. But after reassuring myself of this, the realisation suddenly dawned that my hand, as it went through the wall, had come into contact with something peculiar, something which had felt distinctly like a set of teeth. This was, I am relieved to say, rather more like what Nigel Pargeter found under Walter Gabriel's bath in the arches than the mouth with teeth and with hair about it, which poor Dunning encountered under his pillow in Dr. James's Casting the Wounds. Peering into the hole in the wall, 
I came face to face with a dry, lifeless skull, which I quickly deduced to be the paltry remains of Hannah Waite, whose memorial was a few feet above. In my fall I had knocked the top of the skull away from the jawbone, and also dislodged a small, tarnished metal crucifix which now lay to one side. Brushing myself down I went to tell the rector of my discovery. I was naturally more than a little unsure of what his reaction would be to the havoc I had caused in the church, but I need not have worried. He was in his element, and spent the entire evening telephoning the local newspapers to make arrangements for reporters and photographers to call the next day. I was left to my own devices, so I made some cheese sandwiches for my supper and went to my bedroom with a paperback thriller. Before getting into bed, I spent a few moments at the window, gazing out at the grey expanse of the mud flat spread before me, and lit by the full moon, which glittered strangely on the many little pools. What an ideal location for a ghost story, I thought. Whether the view from the window disturbed me more than I realised, or whether it was just the sandwiches, I had a very restless night with several unpleasant nightmares. In one of the most memorable, I seemed to be watching a scene taking place in a small, cluttered room where a tiny, plump woman was cooking what looked like a stew on a spotless range. Suddenly the door burst open, and a burly, red-faced man lurched in, and judging from his facial expression, I could hear nothing, began screaming at the woman. She gave as good as she got, but this only enraged him further, until at last he grabbed at her, and picking up a skewer from the table, started stabbing her repeatedly with it. In a dream you cannot close your eyes, so I was forced to continue watching, and eventually it became clear that the man, Ernest Waite, as I had assumed by now, was not trying to inflict a mortal wound, but rather a number of superficial ones. Why, I thought, the drunken fool is pricking his wife to find the witch mark. Apparently he was not finding what he wanted, as each wound bled profusely. Then Hannah, who was by this time a sorry sight, abruptly clutched at her chest and fell to the floor. My dream faded, returning almost immediately to the same location, in time to reveal Ernest Waite sawing his wife's head from her body. Mercifully, my view was brief, and quickly melted into a new scene. The mud flats outside the Waite's cottage, where Ernest was digging a hole for a wrapped bundle which lay on the ground beside him. Had it twitched slightly? I fervently hoped not. I think I awoke at this point. I vaguely remember sitting up and looking at my travelling clock on the bedside table, but not taking in the time. Sleep soon returned, and it seemed that I was dreaming again at once, although in fact my final dream of the night must have come some hours later. I was back on the mud flats, observing a running figure which approached with some rapidity. It was Ernest Waite, fleeing towards the river as if the devil himself was at his heels. As he passed the spot where my dream self stood, I realised that a second figure was following in pursuit. At first it looked like an unbelievably gigantic toad, but when it got closer I saw that it was a headless human form. The body was heavily caked with mud which dripped from the tatters of cloth hanging from its frame. Its arms were stretched stiffly out, reaching towards the prey upon which it was gaining fast. If I'd had time to think... I suppose I would have wondered at the purposeful and deliberate way the creature ran. Without its head it should, perhaps, have been groping and hesitant, but on the contrary it seemed to know exactly where it was going and what it intended to do. It quickly drew abreast of me, and I cowered back, not wishing to transfer its attentions to me. But as it continued on its relentless course, my terror suddenly left me, and I was overcome by a wave of compassion and empathy for this poor being who had once been a woman. At this moment my dream self was drawn irresistibly into the body of Hannah Waite. I shared her insane, 
overpowering hatred for the man who had killed her and buried her where she could have no rest. And I shared the awareness of her pitiful remnant of a body, the rankness and the pain. I was blind, but although surrounded by darkness, I saw quite clearly the figure of Ernest Waite, only a few yards ahead of me now, and struggling to free his sinking legs from the marshy ground. As Hannah reached her panic-stricken husband, I was flooded with a feeling of triumph. I wanted to stay, to enjoy and be a part of her revenge, but I felt myself being pulled away again, and my head was filled with a drumming noise. I awoke to the sound of the rector hammering on my door. It was ten o'clock, I had overslept, and the house was in uproar. During the night, it seemed, someone had got into the church and stolen the skull from its recess. Reverend Shaw was full of self-recriminations because— in the excitement of the previous evening, he had left the church door unlocked. A careful search of the building and the churchyard by a small group of us, led by the local constable, produced no clues. The constable was puzzled by the fact that the thief had taken the skull, which possessed no monetary value whatsoever, but had left the altar candlesticks and other small items worth several hundred pounds. I must say that I was not puzzled at all. I wish I could tell you that I found a trail of muddy footprints leading to and from the hole in the wall, but I am afraid this account has no such satisfactory conclusion. However, no living thief was ever found, and the skull was not recovered. These facts, combined with the untroubled sleep which I enjoyed during the rest of my stay in the village, led me to believe that Hannah Waite now rests complete and peaceful in her marshy grave.'